This is a um, basically a financial economics paper uh, about the financial implications of a legal major legal event. Uh, here in the presentation, I, I would like to focus, and I would like you to focus on on the legal implications rather than on the uh, you know fine details of the financial finance methodology. So, what we do in this paper is to uh, test essentially test the value of securities fraud class actions with regard to foreign, uh, foreign firms. But the question, in fact, is, is broader. Um, we ask, uh, is there any use, is there any value in 10b-5 uh, class actions? The basic setting is uh, one in which you, you have investors in a public company, and usually you think that the law provides that if they are defrauded, they can sue, usually in a... Uh, hopefully uh, uh, in a class action, and get compensated for, uh, for any damage they suffered. Now suppose the law takes away the right, the investor's right to sue and get compensated. What would happen? You, you would have certain expectations, and uh, we uh, test such an event, or we f uh, examine such an event in, uh, in the US. Uh, the natural experiment, the natural legal experiment that we take advantage of is a famous ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in, in Morrison versus National Australia Bank, uh, which limited the reach of uh, American securities fraud law, uh, limited the, the scope of private uh, cause of action or private claims under 10b-5 uh, only to domestic transactions. Uh, what that did with regard to foreign investors, with regard foreign traders, people who traded, sold, or, or purchased their, uh, their securities outside the United States, it essentially did away with civil liability. Uh, it, it shielded public companies uh, from being sued by foreign uh, traders, I'll, I'll refer to them as foreign traders. Uh, when you read Morrison carefully enough, it also did away, or it was about to do away, also with public enforcement. Um, so. As a result, there was a much limited, much, much more limited, maybe even a zero deterrence due to civil liability. Uh, and, and this is where we're going to look. Uh, well, how did the market uh, react? Well, it didn't. It, it, it did. I mean, mar the markets did react, uh, but with indifference. Or under more lenient uh, assumptions, uh, markets were actually happy about this news, about firms not being able to be sued, uh, or about investors not being able to sue uh, for 10b-5 or for securities fraud, um, which, which is surprising, which is surprising and, and should give us pause if, if you, pause if you believe the results. Uh, we usually refer to this uh, situation or this, this question uh, under the, the title of bonding. Uh, Bonding is a theory that has to do with cross-listing, uh, namely a situation in which a public company has its securities listed for trading in more than one country. Uh, and when it comes to uh, being listed in the United States, there's a long literature that argues that foreign companies, especially, particularly companies that are based in, in, in countries with weak corporate governance uh, legal environment, may want to list their shares in the United States in order to, essentially to rent the U.S. legal regime as a bonding mechanism, as a credible commitment to behave, to comply with disclosure uh, duties and so on and so forth. Um, how does this work exactly? I won't go into the details. I think you can intuitively grasp, grasp the idea. There could be uh, a, a more extensive, dis extensive disclosure duties, but what the literature has focused on more, more recently, it's about the threat of litigation. It's about the threat of being sued, uh, particularly civil liability uh, in, in a class action setting in the US. Um, there's some additional literature, some, some of which I, I, I'm involved in, some uh, is, uh, is put forward by my, by my partner, uh, Jordan Siegel, Essentially what we say is that it's not only about deterrence. I mean, company, foreign firms come to the United States not only 
for uh, uh, you know, making this credible commitment due to legal bonding, they may want to make a reputational, uh, a, a, to take a step of reputational bonding. So it's not being, you know, it's not that they fear of getting sued, that they want to establish a certain reputation of, of good behavior. And uh, I'll, I'll put my contribution aside for the sake of time. There is a big identification challenge, uh, meaning that it's very difficult to pin down the uh, effect of the legal regime because a lot of things happen when a foreign firm comes to the United States. Uh, it increases its visibility, it, has, it establishes connections with the capital markets uh, in other ways than through the uh, listing and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it, an authoritative summary by, by Andy Caroli uh, says that uh, a proper verdict about the bonding hypothesis, especially uh, of its pure legal form, has not yet been rendered. What did Morrison do? In order to understand what Morrison did, uh, uh, you have to briefly have, a, have an idea about what the law did was before. And the law in the United States used to be that even though uh, the actual fraud may not have taken place within the United States, a U.S. court could assert jurisdiction and other uh, authorities could assert jurisdiction over that conduct under uh, two alternative tests. One is the conduct test. If at least some significant part of the fraud was uh, or took, did take place in the United States, then there could be jurisdiction. Or if the effect of a purely foreign conduct took place uh, within the United States, then there could be jurisdiction. Morrison, the Supreme Court in Morrison did away with that. Uh, the Supreme Court said there's only one condition, uh, or one test that you should use in order to uh, interpret the international or the territorial reach of Section 10B, the, the fraud uh, provision, which is Section 10B uh, reaches only in connection with the purchase or sale of security listed on an American stock exchange and the purchase or sale of any other security in the United States. Namely, it's a purely territorial test. If the bad if, if the transaction, sorry, if the trade uh, took place within the United States, later interpreted as took place in an American or on an American stock exchange uh, or an American market, then you have a 10b-5 private claim. If it didn't, if it took place, if the transaction, the trade took place outside of the United States, you don't have a private claim. That is, you cannot, as a foreign trader, even though you're American, or definitely uh, for sure if, if you're a foreign, investor, if you traded outside the United States, you cannot uh, join a class action that would be filed in the United States. For most countries, I mean for trading in most countries outside, uh, other than the United States, that means you lose your hope of, you lose your hope of, of uh, getting any compensation for the fraud. Um, what would you expect if you if you're a, a foreign trader or an investor who traded outside the United States and you now hear the news about Morrison? Uh, you know, you'd be sad. Uh, this is this is bad news. Uh, I'm going to be defrauded at some likelihood, and as you know, as as against the the legal situation uh, up till now, now I won't be able to join a class action and get some compensation. Uh, that, that's bad news. That's bad news for investors and that's bad news for companies as well because they lose some of the bonding uh, mechanism. The whole idea behind legal bonding is that managers and controlling shareholders fear of you know, being sued and therefore they behave. If you tell them now you're going to be shielded from at least uh, some part of, uh, 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 of your potential uh, plaintiffs, the amount or the scope or the intensity of the deterrence would shrink, uh, which, is, which is bad news. This is like loss, loss of commitment, loss of deterrence. Uh, if you look at, at investors' point of view, you would expect or you would hypothesize that they would adjust to this new legal environment. For instance, they would shift their trades to the United States in order to take advantage of this essentially option value of being able to join in a class action and at least get some compensation uh, uh, for, for some future fraud. Uh, the focal event that we focus, the, the, that we uh, take advantage of, is actually the oral argument, not the day of publication of, of the decision in June 24th, uh, because that was a very noisy event. The Dodd-Frank Act was, uh, was agreed on on the same date, so 
it's not, it's not a clean uh, event, although we test for a result for, for the market reaction and that date and, and find similar results. But what we do focus on is on the all, all argument event and, and the news were following closely uh, this, this all argument and uh, several news channels were reporting from court or right after the, uh, the argument coming out with the news that the Supreme Court doesn't want foreign investors uh, in, in U.S. courts. Uh, they got it quite right, in fact, and there was a number of statements, very strong statements by the justices, essentially saying we don't want foreign, invest foreign traders uh, to, to litigate their claims uh, in, in, uh, in the United States. Namely, they don't have a 10b-5 private claim. Uh, we look at all, let, let's skip the data and let, let, let's go directly to the results. What happens? As I mentioned, uh, if you adopt a more stringent set of assumptions, technical methodologies, markets reacted with indifference. Nobody cared. This is surprising. This is not what you would expect uh, under like a standard deterrence due to civil liability kind of, kind of logic. If you uh, adopt other methodologies or somewhat less stringent assumptions, markets were happy. They reacted with glee. This is good news. What could explain such a positive reaction? Well, perhaps, perhaps, you know, 10b-5 class sections for securities fraud might, just might, be a nuisance. Maybe they're just a burden. Maybe they're just a waste of time and resources. We cannot know for sure. This is not what we are testing here. But at least it's consistent with some of, of the results. We look at other reactions, we look at uh, uh, other measures of potential uh, th risk or, or, or likelihood of misbehavior uh, in, in terms of corporate governance or other selection risk uh, by looking at the bid-ask spread. How much, this is a measure, a financial measure of how much market traders hedge against the possibility that there may be, uh, may be trading in, in a, a, a while being informationally uh, inferior or, or uh, an information asymmetry that goes against them and we see no reaction. So the way mar market participants reacted to this change uh, is, uh, is not consistent with any uh, bonding role or any positive corporate governance role of civil liability. Why do we believe that this has to do with legal bonding? Because we do observe some proportional reactions. So, Market, market participants were happier the more capital is, rid, uh, is listed outside of the United States. That is, we look at, at this measure of non-US uh, capital, uh, that the, the capital of, of, the, of the firm that's listed out of the, outside of the United States as a crude proxy for the relative amount of shielding or the relative scope of shielding uh, due to Morrison. Because these are the claims, these, this is the capital that, that cannot substantiate, that cannot support uh, a 10b5 uh, cause of action. And, and the, the larger the non-US capital, I mean, the more the company tr is listed and trades outside of the United States, the happier uh, market participants were. Happier in the sense that markets reacted abnormally positively to the news coming from the, from the Supreme Court. Uh, let's, let's skip this and conclude. So, if you believe our results, uh, then, then the paper poses a number of challenges, uh, most basically to the value of securities fraud class actions. Uh, and and this, this is pretty much in line with a, you know, a line of literature in the last 20 years or so, uh, talking about the circularity problem, essentially saying that class actions uh, don't serve any good purpose because what happens in a class, in a securities fraud class action, is current shareholders paying past shareholders, uh, which is a wash, and the only parties who are happy with that is, uh, are the lawyers and the insurers. Uh, that's important in its own right. Uh, but maybe there are cheaper ways to support these guys than you know, all this mechanism. Uh, it may be, if, if you believe the results, uh, there may be, uh, it may be a challenge to legal bonding, and even more broadly, more, more fundamentally, it could be a challenge uh, to, you know, deterrence through civil liability. Because what we have here, the, the foreign firm and cross-listing, uh, this, is, this is marginal, this is secondary. What we have here is like a, a laboratory, a clean laboratory, looking at a 
natural experiment in legal regimes where you have one set of, of, of firms that is the remains subject to a certain legal regime of, of civil liability, another one that is gradually shielded from, sev uh, from civil liability, and the markets, either they don't care or they're relatively happy about, about the results. Um, again, let's skip the cross-listing specific uh, issues that may be less interesting in this form. Uh, policy implications. Well, again, if you believe the results, um, there's, there's probably no way around uh, strengthening uh, local, I mean, home country uh, institution, governance institutions. Countries and firms most likely cannot rent uh, the institutions, the legal institutions of other countries. This does not mean that they cannot rent U.S. capital markets for reputational purposes. In fact, we believe that this is what what they do. They don't rent the civil liability mechanism to enhance their value and to uh, enhance their corporate governance. Thank you.